Denver has an air pollution problem, and the world has a climate change problem. All those fancy RTD trains should help fix that, right? If we really want to see a better city, a better world, we have to change. I'm Nathaniel Miner, host of CPR's podcast, Ghost Train. In this show, I take a deep look at how transit could fix big issues our cities are facing, if we let it. Follow Ghost Train wherever you get your podcasts. Now I have this new degree, what am I going to do with it? Paulina Lerma is a teacher in Denver Public Schools. She's taught for seven years at Green Valley Elementary School. And now she wants to make a big career leap. Or at least she thinks she does. Do I stay in the school that I absolutely love? My heart and my soul, my tears, my everything, my sweat is there. Smeared all over the walls, just kidding. (laughs) But, like, do I stay there? Or do I explore the different avenues? Paulina has a dream that someday she'll be able to make changes in education that would inspire students to believe that they can achieve anything and that there should be no limits blocking their paths to success. But in order to do this, she must become a school principal. For Paulina, this is a huge leap, not just for her, but for the work she does in the community. Hi, my amor. How are you? Good. Hi, love. How was your day at school today? Good. What did you learn? You learned homework? That's awesome. As a bilingual elementary teacher, she doesn't just educate Spanish-speaking students, but she also helps and translates school issues and homework tasks to the parents. The community has come to rely on Paulina, but can she do more to help her community from a position of power? Currently, 20% of the district principals are from the Latino community, which doesn't sound too bad until you realize that Latino students make up over half the district's student population. Denver Public Schools has been slow to recognize the changes. Too many Latino students and parents feel that they're ignored by schools. With Latino students scoring low in reading and math, parents are worried. We have approximately 52% uh, Latino, Mexicano, Chicano community uh, of students across the district. And we've had underrepresentation on this board. This is the first school school year. This is Systemic, a series that tells stories of those who fight injustice as they attempt to dismantle the status quo. I'm Joe Erickson. In this episode, we follow a Latina woman who feels like she has to do it all. Driven by her desires and overwhelming responsibility to elevate her community, she's on a mission to solve the problems of the lack of representation among Latinos in education. But she's torn between being a classroom teacher and an administrator. Where will she do the most good? When I first met Paulina, I was immediately struck by her smile. It was warm and engaging. It made me feel like we'd known each other for years. But that's Paulina's gift. She leaves you with feelings of happiness and optimism. So when I received her audio diaries, I was not surprised that the same optimism, even in difficult times, would shine through. Hello, Paulina here. Um, Last time I sent a voice recording was... uh... Paulina Lerma has been teaching English and general studies to third graders at Green Valley Elementary School. Her class is diverse. All her students speak Spanish as their first language. Most of them are the first generations to be born in the U.S., 
and a few are immigrants. At the beginning of the academic year, Paulina gets her students to take control over their classroom and make it their space with their voice. Paulina has a system of alternating class presidents as a way of giving her students some control of their environment. Classroom presidents, we need to have a meeting so we can decide how we're going to celebrate our 10 classroom points. So maybe we can have that meeting tomorrow. All right, your responsibility to come with to me during your lunch time is going to be a working lunch. I have um, Ms. Lerma's assistant, will you please grab my sunglasses? Thank you. Yes, will you help me? She strongly believes by empowering them to make decisions, it creates confidence and gradually students develop a belief that they can learn new things quickly. Her belief is rooted in her own childhood experiences of going to school and struggling because she spoke little to no English. You see, Paulina was raised in Mexico. My father did own his own company and my mother also had her own business and they, we were let's just say very comfortable living in Mexico, you know? We were very close. Um, we would do fun things on the weekends and we just really enjoyed each other's companies. Um, growing up with my two older siblings, um, I learned very quick how to be competitive. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, being taken care of was always just a beautiful thing. Paulina was happy there. They say it takes a village. Well, it's true in Paulina's case. Village life was simple. Everyone looked out for each other. Playing in streets was normal. Life was easy at home and at school. Paulina's competitive nature made her excel in her studies. I loved reading. I remember I was only like seven years old and I was eager to learn more and more and that's just the way it was, you know. But nothing lasts forever. Paulina's parents divorced and everything changed. Her mother thought Paulina would have more opportunities in the US. She decided that I was going to be sent to my grandmother's um, whom, yes, I knew and I loved, but it wasn't the same, right? So going from, I would say, a place of privilege in Mexico, I loved school. Here I am, 10 years old, getting ready to go to sixth grade, actually. I get to Borger, Texas. It's a small little town in Texas, in the Panhandle area, and... Um, there wasn't a lot of people of color, and it was very evident when I when I moved in with my grandmother that it wasn't going to be a fun place. This was a big change for Paulina. Not only does she have to cope with a new family in a different country, but the thing that hurt her the most was she started to hate the thing she loved the most, her school. I was supposed to go to sixth grade, and obviously because I did not know any English, I was held back and I accepted it. She remembers her first class in the U.S. and how teachers and students reacted to her. This memory has stayed with her. It has also made her the teacher she is now. When I was... Uh, beginning classes, I immediately felt the fear, the look in their eyes, the, what are we going to do with her? The, the, they're, they're, they were just baffled. They didn't know how to accept me in their classrooms. Um, they, I didn't know any English, right? So, hey, fair enough. I get it as a teacher now, right? But then it was like I came with so much. I wanted to show them everything I knew. And unfortunately, immediately, right, from the moment they hold me back, they're automatically assuming I don't know much. And I remember 
doing a math assessment and I did it. And the teacher immediately accused me of cheating. In Mexico, their school system uses a different way of teaching math. When Paulina presented the correct answer using a different way to solve the problem, her teacher reacted badly. She was convinced that Paulina had cheated. After all, how could it be that a Latina student with no English could be good at anything? She couldn't explain how did I get all the answers correctly in math. I mean, again, she just disregarded it. And from there on, again, it was experience after experience. My own experiences as a student really probably should have left me thinking. I don't think I ever thought that I was going to become a teacher, but hey, here I am, even wanting to become a principal. <laughs> this experience drove Paulina to look at changing education so that no child would ever experience what she experienced. Paulina was determined that racial stereotypes and low expectations of Latino students should be removed from all classrooms. And she has a way of doing this. She does this by creating culturally responsive spaces with Latinx books and comics, but mostly by valuing her students. We're not seeing the true story behind each one of our students, you know. And if the student is feeling in a safe place, they feel loved, they feel cared for, then maybe, just maybe, they'll begin to learn. If you build that relationship with them, you get to know what are their interests. I've been able to see within my own classroom culture, giving, giving them voice, that's like Oh my gosh, you know, in my classroom, I pretty much allow the students to run the classroom on their own. And you may be questioning, like, what, what do you mean? So as I build trust with them, we begin each day by each student having a classroom job, right? Whether it's taking attendance or taking the lunch count, it's giving them a sense of belonging, do you know? And that to me is so valuable because, again, we create this culture in the classroom. Then I remove this whole thing of kids don't want to come to school. They, they want to come to school. They want to be a part of our community. Pauline is participating in a principal training course so that she can realize her dream of one day becoming a school principal but she's not sure she's ready to start next year. She's afraid that if she leaves to become a principal, that's one less classroom with a Spanish-speaking teacher who understands the needs of Latinx students. By mid-October, Paulina stays up late working on papers for her course. The program is at University of Denver, Morgridge College of Education. They teamed up with Denver Public Schools to provide a program to produce the next leaders in education. This program encourages teachers of color who want to become the next principal or superintendent to apply. It's called the Ritchie Program for School Leaders. Paulina struggles to keep up with the pace of the course. I'm a mother, right? And I'm a teacher and I'm in the Ritchie program and I have many, many, many things going on. And me having to orchestrate all of that and arranging for pickup for my children and, you know, that was so hard to make sure that the project for the Ritchie program was completed. Paulina is doing this work to fulfill a dream. She also has to be focused on her own family. 
How important is this dream? Is it worth rearranging her whole life to attain it? And then, a family crisis hit. Her mother was facing cancer treatment. I remember how hectic that week was. Um, And unfortunately, I cannot say things have gotten any better. I was getting ready for my mother's surgery. My mom got diagnosed with colon cancer. She was supposed to have surgery. And obviously, you know, when, when you hear this, that a loved one has cancer, it's almost inevitable, right, to think that your loved one is in danger. And the only thing you want to do is make sure that they have surgery, that they get the, the, the cancer out, and you hope to hear the best news. But surgery was delayed. Rescheduling appointment for January 31st. So we're back to square one. Uh, it's been very hard. I have a lot of faith, and I, I, I like to be very aware and do a lot of self-care. Unfortunately, lately it's been extra, extra, extra difficult trying to finish the program, trying to finish some more projects that were due, uh, having to do postings every Wednesday, and then having to just be present. For Paulina, the year is flying by. She can't believe it's February already. She's having doubts about her course. It's a lot of extra work. She has to organize her time between the Ritchie program, her class, and her students' parents. But it's hard to keep juggling all these things. There's a part of her that feels that she's turning her back on people who need her. If she completes the course and becomes a principal, what happens to them? How will they cope without her? This weighs heavily on her mind. After all, she loves teaching. She loves her community. Is this dream really worth it? I feel like I have that part now, and then I can actually be that community resource provider. Paulina knows how alienating the world can be when you don't speak English. Many of her students' parents only speak Spanish and struggle to access educational resources or even know how their child is doing in school. For these parents, Paulina is someone they trust and someone they can rely on. I take that so personally as I was raised with a monolingual parent who didn't understand There was really nobody you could go to. And right now, when I can make myself available to the parents, to the students, that they can see me in that position, uh, available to them at all times. It doesn't matter what grade you're in. Often I find myself hugging other students of other classrooms that I've never had in my classroom, and they just love coming up to me, and I love it as well. Because Paulina does so much to help her community at school, How would these parents fare if Paulina moves on? Who will step into this voluntary role of helping non-English speaking parents navigate the education system? But she'll have to make a decision soon about whether to apply for principal jobs next year. By March, Paulina can see the end of her program in sight. She is still weighing out her options. She loves teaching, but she has to work hard on her leadership course. She also recognises that her culture is her sense of strength that she doesn't want to hide. Can she be her authentic self as an administrator? I see myself in my students. I see my struggles in them. And I see the the fact that they're not going through the same struggles as I am because they're learning in their native language. And I never was. My language was ripped from me. Again, I was ashamed 
of my culture. And I cannot tell you how many times I was ashamed. I wanted to be a güerita with blue eyes. It's taken me a while to understand the fact that I am blessed to be brown, right? I am blessed because I know two languages. Now I know my purpose, right? And so my message is, how am I showing up as a brown leader? You know, am I showing up with my cumbia and my merengue and my salina? blowing out my speakers or am I still hiding that and that's the part that I I don't want to be afraid of of showing students showing the kids that your heritage that your brown is it's a blessing you know I want that little Paulinita to know that hey you're here now and I'm blessed to be brown that I have nothing to be ashamed of Paulina spent the spring break with her mother and her kids. She had some thinking to do. We just got done with our spring break and it's been our first week back. Ah, it's been bittersweet, right? So like I can see my kids growing. I can see, you know, my students just blossoming, but at the same time it's bitter because I know that I'm not going to be in the classroom next year. You know, I, I'm, I am currently in the Ritchie program and that's what I'm going to school for. And while I did dance around the idea of staying in the classroom one more year, it's just, it's time. And I think the movement is now. Uh, the fact that everything's happening right now with like all the different districts talking about all these political issues and policies that are really hindering our students. And while they're probably not necessarily aware of what's going on, I know that this is going to affect them and their future. It's a real true commitment for my community and my students and their future to become a leader in a district where I can lead, I can inspire and I can tell my story and that students can see the endless possibilities. It wasn't long after her decision to become an administrator, Paulina applied for an administrative position at her school. I'll always be a teacher at heart, I'll always be a student at heart. And so with that said, I feel a little anxious because I applied for the um, senior team lead position, and while I didn't get it, I am not disappointed. I have faith that if I really did attend this very rigorous and very amazing program of the Ritchie program, it, to prepare me to be a principal, that's where like all of my commitment and my sacrifices this year has been around that, like at the end of the year, I want to end up with a job for the following year to make sure that I am able to create equitable access. By April, Paulina had almost completed her projects for the Ritchie program. Soon she'll be qualified to become a principal. Paulina wastes no time. She's already applied for 12 principal positions. While she's doing this, She's dreaming about what type of principal she would be. I'm envisioning working for a school where the vast majority of students are of free and reduced lunch and potentially still stay here in the far northeast. And that is my goal. In addition to looking at bringing in different programs and different uh, resources, like I said, for the families to learn English, um, to continue perhaps even their GDs, food banks, clinics, and, you know, medical resources. And I think the most important thing right now is going to be like any mental health programs and partnering with perhaps universities. After several weeks, 
Paulina still hasn't had any replies to job applications. She's a little disappointed, but she's still positive something will turn up. But then, life throws you a curveball. This is the audio diary she sent me. Honestly, it's just been a rough, rough road. On April 28th, um, which is almost a week and a half ago, I got in a car accident. It was a hit and run. I had a car full of kids, uh, six kids to be exact. It was horrific to the extent that my daughter and her friend had to go to the hospital. I ended up spending two days in the hospital with so much pain. If it wasn't for my faith, honestly, I think I would have already lost it. With my mom's cancer this year and everything, it's been insane. Honestly, just a little bit more than I can, that I've been able to handle. And I will not be able to go back to work until May 18th because the concussion was so severe, it's been affecting my vision, it, it's affected my speech, and I, I have a really bad pain in my back and my neck. Needless to say, it's been a journey. This was the first time I heard Paulina sound down and depressed. In all the audio diaries, I heard Paulina overcome doubt and obstacles with grace. She always sees joy and happiness in everything life throws at her. But in May, broken in body and worried about her daughter and anxiously waiting to hear back from principal job applications, she struggled. I don't know how to stop. With school and trying to finish the Ritchie program and trying to be a mom and be a wife and, you know, be a professional. I, I think I cried myself to sleep the other night. And despite the fact that I know a lot of people are, are there for me, you still can't help but to feel defeated. But I mean, I don't lose sight that I have a purpose, that everything that is happening is for a purpose, right? And so because I have my faith, you know, I just pray that everything turns out the way it needs to. And to understand the assignment, really, to take care of myself. Paulina struggled with her health for months. She had a neck brace and walked with a cane. On her first day back, her students cheered. She returned to school even though she wasn't fully fit, but it was a distraction from hunting for a new job. Then, there are events that remind you how fragile life is. The unthinkable has happened again. An American elementary school targeted by a gunman who entered Robb Elementary in the small farming town of Uvalde, Texas, and opened fire. The day after a shooter killed 19 children and two teachers at the elementary school in Uvalde, Paulina addressed her own elementary class. Miss Lerma might have a tear or two because I feel bad. It's something that really happened and needs to bring us together in solidarity. And our just our, our prayers are out for those family members who have lost their, their second grader, their third grader, and their fourth grader. So give me a second. So we're going we're gonna to invite the bell, and here we go. We're just going to bring our minds. Just come to me, okay? Come here today in your body, right? It's okay. It's okay. And here we go. One, two, three. I'm going to do this three times, so that was one, 
Here we go once again. I'm just gonna hear a little bit of the bell. Here we go. One more time. We're gonna hear from um, our students. Those people didn't deserve to be to be sent away because they're they're just normal kids. They they're just playing around. They they it was the barely new of their life. They barely they barely started their new life, and they didn't deserve. Yeah, it's 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 hard, right? When when we have people that we love so close to us, so I can't imagine, right, what the families of these little kids are At the feeling same time, right now. It's a lot of pain. Yeah, and so I mean, hopefully that'll help them get through that, right? A little over a week later, Paulina's school year came to a close. The shooting in Uvalde, Texas deeply affected her Latino community, and the tragedy eclipsed everything else from her mind. So it was a surprise when Paulino got nominated for Teacher of the Year. I got nominated as the 2023 Colorado Teacher of the Year. And oh my goodness, I cannot even begin to share how humble and how um, amazing this opportunity feels to me right now. Especially because, again, I, I don't know what I'm going to do next year. In the American culture, you guys call it the silver lining, I guess. And to me, that is, you know, it's like, wow, look at everything I've gone through. And as I look at my journey, as I look at where, how I've gotten here, um, it's just once again um, reiterating to me that I'm on the right path and that I am passionate and that I love what I do and I love showing up the way I am now. Paulina had to wait a whole nail-biting summer but in August, she was finally offered a job as an assistant principal at a high school in Denver Public Schools. She was delighted when she told me, and I was happy for her. By October 2022, she settled into a new role, and we also had news that she had advanced as a finalist for Colorado Teacher of the Year. What was really on her mind was how to inspire others to reach for their dreams. This is her last audio diary. I'm actually the first Latina administrator in the school's almost 100 years old. So speaking living testament that through and despite all the challenges all of the things that I've had to face, that I'm still here, right? I'm still standing and I will continue to stand. Um, and again, for my students, my students of color, and hopefully I get to inspire people, get to see that when you hold on to hope and that you have faith that, yes, we're still humans. Yes, we will continue to fail. Yes, we will continue to fall and all of that, but just hold on to the dream, hold on to the light, hold on to the impossible. And one day you will make it possible. Paulina is still working on her dream to become a principal. During the summer, she gained a scholarship. She's pursuing a doctorate in education so that she can be even more qualified. But I wonder why Paulina needs to take that extra step when others from her course, mostly white educators, have already got a job as a principal. Why does Paulina have to jump through the hurdle of an assistant principal role 
and even a PhD before she can show her leadership skills. In making this podcast, I met some remarkable people. Against all odds, they overcame barriers. Negative stereotypes overwhelmed teachers. Administrators moved the goalposts. School board members posted racial and transphobic comments. Despite all that, Melissa, Naomi, Kevin and Paulina did not stop nor waver in their convictions. They kept moving forward. We spent the season with four individuals, a parent, an educator, a teacher, and a would-be principal of color. They fought to make changes in their district. Though each school district seemed to have a different vision of education, one district chose to roll back equity policies, the other worked to deliver equity. Both districts shared one thing. Both districts struggled to hear the voices of these individuals. We end the season with these individuals continuing the fight to be heard. This season of Systemic was reported and written by me, Joe Erickson. It was edited by Erin Jones and produced by Rebecca Romberg, Kibwe Cooper and Emily Williams. Our theme music is by Daniel Mesher. Brad Turner and Kevin Dale are our executive producers. Find a complete list of everyone who worked on this podcast in the show notes. Systemic is a production of Colorado Public Radio. Hey, it's Joe. Since you listened to the whole episode, I have a quick favor to ask you. Take a moment to find Systemic from Colorado Public Radio on whatever podcast app you use. And give us a like, a rating, or a review. If you think the stories we're sharing are important, if you think the voices in Systemic deserve to be heard, all you have to do to help spread the word is like us, rate us, or review us. It helps others find this podcast. Thanks for listening, and thanks for supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio.